Willkommen alle zusammen. Ich bin Erhard Bulze und lade Sie ein zu einem Gespräch mit einem Mann, der auf ein langes Leben für den dänischen Film zurückblickt. Er hat Filme geschnitten und eigene Spielfilme gemacht und Fernsehserien. Und er ist ein enger Mitarbeiter von Lars von Trier als Editor und Regieassistent. Und er hat auch mal Mitte der 80er Jahre in Lübeck gedreht, im Schabbelhaus und im Lübecker Bahnhof. Das war für seinen Zirkusfilm The Flying Devils. Herzlich willkommen, Annas Reffen. Hallo, Annas Reffen. I guess I may say you are an old friend, a very old friend of uh, Nordische Filmtage Lübeck. Do you remember the first time? Yes, definitely, because uh, my first uh, visit to Lübeck was in 1976. Uh, and uh, I went there with my first film, Strömer, which was a police film, like, uh, like a cinema noir police film, which was very well received in Denmark. Uh, we won three uh, prizes, critic prizes, a Bodil prize. And of course, it was very, as a young director, it was fascinating to suddenly be at a, a festival. And at that time, uh, Lübeck was the, the meeting point for all the Scandinavian directors, Bo Wiederberg, uh, uh, Henning Carlsen, uh, uh, Jan Troel, uh, and all, the, all the, the Scandinavian directors met in Lübeck every year. And it was a very inspiring, interesting place to show your film. So, I, and then I have showed my other films. I made a film called The Baron, which was a period film based on a, on a novel by a, a close friend of August Strindberg, a Danish author called Gustav Wied. Uh, which uh, also uh, went to other, a lot of other festivals. And uh, then I made uh, my English uh, international try with Senta Berger, Erlan Josefsson, and, and uh, uh, Mario David, the French actor, was about the circus troupe traveling around in, in Europe. Uh, and at that time, uh, of course, it was as a homage to the nice reception I've had in, in Lübeck that I wanted to shoot and I had to find an elegant restaurant in France, uh, no, suddenly, sorry, in, in Germany. So I, I, I knew Schappelhaus from, from the festival day. So we got the permission to shoot there and also shoot a, shot a scene on the, on the railway central station in, in Lübeck. So, uh, but uh, we won five Danish robots for, uh, for the film, but the film collapsed more or less because of my producer went bankrupt uh, right before the film was released. So I got a very nice uh, greeting from Ingmar Bergman. He saw he had seen the film twice and he couldn't understand that the film uh, didn't open a lot of doors into the international market. But Unfortunately, everything collapsed with the, with the bankruptcy of my producer, so and it stayed in the box for many years. I though I went though to to festivals in Rio de Janeiro and Toronto and so the film, but 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 it was a complicated thing. And then, uh, Anas, uh, Anas, may I interrupt yes. and, and get back to Strömer, the first police film and the television series you made afterwards on the same idea. Uh, and what I want to ask is what I've read uh, in the Danish Film Institute's uh, uh, internet uh, text, and they are saying that um, in these television films about the police, you could see your rule-breaking editing, which was anticipating the very unconventional narrative form of uh, Breaking the Wave, one of the famous films of Lars von Trier. Uh, so you sort of uh, invented new ways to put a film together before even Lars von Trier did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I met Lars von Trier in the film school and I was his teacher. And of course, we discussed a lot uh, the aesthetics of cinema. And we and he was very interested in editing also Lars. So when he asked me to be the editor of uh, because 
in between my my uh, jobs as a director, I have worked as an editor and assistant director because that's what we normally did in Denmark in those days. But uh, so I, I knew Lars very well, and and then we made a manifesto uh, because we wanted to break the rules of the traditional uh, visual continuity, which was a rule in those days and still is in a lot of films. So we wanted really to to to. To read ten commandments, like in the dogma, actually, it was before the dogma. This one, but we made a dogma of, of get in late and get out early, make jump cuts, jump the the, the optical acts, and all these things, which were the rules for editing. We tried to violate them as as good as we could, because we want to achieve another. Um, uh, uh, we called it emotional editing. Instead of, 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 of editing on, on, on the logics or the geography, we decided to edit on motions. And that was the key, uh, that was the key idea of, 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 this, uh, of breaking the ways that we wanted to not, not to, to uh, get very late into the scenes and leave them very early so people could fill out this this, uh, this hole they were in the editing with their own ideas and emotions. And, and this was the first time I re uh, received a, a prize as an editor because the film was so ugly edited. So everybody <laughs> could see that in an editor. But the e emotional output of breaking was, was huge. As uh, We were in Cannes with the film and we won the Grand Prix de Jury and the people were crying and there was applauding for half an hour or something it was uh, uh, but uh, francis ford coppola who was uh, the president of the jury he hated the film he thought it was the most ugly film he had seen in his life but but emotionally uh, this film reached a huge audience and that was very interesting and very surprising for us because it was a really an experiment and i thought i thought i thought it to work I thought it was very fascinating breaking the waves, uh, but may I get back to the very, very early days of Lars Trier that was before he got himself that little fun, which uh, isn't actually his name. He was Lars Trier when you met him in the first place. I could imagine mm -hmm. without the fun. Uh, what do you mm -hmm. uh, What can you tell us about uh, what you saw the first time you saw Lars? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, as I, I was, first time I, I, when I met Lars in the film school, he was a very rebellious student. I was there only as a uh, as a freelance teacher. I was not permanent teacher there, but but he was he he didn't want to listen to the teachers, uh, so he sat with his uh, workman uh, when the teacher was talking. His earphones. As soon as the examples came up on the screen, then he took off his workman and looked at the screen. So. And, and, and this was a provocation, of course, for the teachers. Uh, and one of the teachers said, fun, three year to, 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 because he was so arrogant. So he was like, a, make a fool of him. And then he said, thank you very much. I would, would love to have, <laughs> this sounds very nice in my ears. And of course, he also had the idea that he had a Jewish background because he thought that his father, uh, 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 who, who was a Jew, uh, he wanted to, to provoke his 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 uh, his his, his uh, father with 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 uh, the, the the diploma film he made in the film school dealing with an SS officer walking home through Jutland, blinded by the Danish resistance movement they had uh, 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 blinded him, uh, uh, pressing his eyes uh, eyeballs in. So, uh, but then Lars uh, learned from his mother that uh, this man was not his father because his was, uh, was a, a German family, actually, Hartmann, who so was his, his biological father. So that would go change a lot for Lars. So, so, and that's why he tried to make fun also when we did Melancholia, the press conference in Cannes, and it became a disaster when he was telling a, a stupid Danish joke about Hitler uh, and then everything collapsed, as you know, and we were thrown out of the, the festival, as you know, so it was, uh, but, but yeah. Lars has, I have also worked with, with Lars on Dance in the Dark, where we won the Golden uh, Palms in, in, 
in Cannes, and we also won with Antichrist, and I with Dogville, and we met yeah. also the house that Jack built. And uh, so, so I have a long career with, with Lars, and he's a close friend, and it's always very interesting to work with him. So, and may, he's may, a great may, artist. May I ask, how, how often do you see him nowadays? He, during the shoot of the house that Jack built, he he was very ill. And in fact, he all his his health is not so good. So uh, so I don't see him that often. But we talk on the, on the phone together. But the, now he's preparing the the, the follow up on on the kingdom. Uh, but I cannot participate because I have my own film. So so he has to work himself on that. But. Uh, but we still have a, a very good, a very intense friendship, and, and I think uh, I respect him a lot. I think he's one of the greatest directors of the world cinema. So that uh, leads me to my last question about Denmark being a small country, but a country which has become, let's say, a real film country with an international audience and some of the Danish filmmakers are nowadays directing quite big productions abroad. How would you explain this Danish film success if you look back on I your think, life? I think the, the new way in Danish film started with my generation, actually, in the mid-60s, where the Danish government decided to have a film law in, in, in Denmark, because you knew that, that uh, the, the commercial film studios were collapsing more or less all of them during that period because TV came along and the expenses were much too big for, 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 for them to survive. And then if we should have a, a language on cinema, then the, the government had to come up with a law to support the Danish film industry. And, uh, and, and, and of course, also the, the second thing was that they also decided to have a film school. And, and I was in the second generation of film students in Denmark. I started as in the commercial industry, but then I went to the film school. And of course, this has been a huge success for, for, for Danish cinema. For example, in Switzerland, where they don't have any, uh, it's also a small country, but, but they have almost none, no film production anymore. But of course, it's a political question whether you want to have a national identity on the silver screen. And I think it has been a, a huge success for the, for the social democratic government's ideas of, of promoting culture and art. So, and uh, especially when, when now, when, when, uh, when the borders in, the, in Europe are, are falling and we are, I think the, 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 the national uh, culture is, of course, a very strong uh, identity uh, platform for, for, uh, for us to, to, to promote Danish art, culture and ideas and even our ugly language we have managed to distribute all over the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> When you see uh, your news film about the German occupation, uh, do you think uh, one c can see it's a Danish film? I know it's about Denmark and you see the Danes and so on, but uh, is there a sort of Danish style of filmmaking nowadays? Yes, I think uh, the, 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 the Danish, uh, it's re of course it reflected uh, some of the, the values of uh, Danish values of, of humanism, tolerance and, and whatever we try to, to mention which is positive about around being Danish. Uh, but but also I think it's, it, it's, it stands on the, on, on the way of, of movie making which uh, Lars and I, but also Morten Hahnfeld, Henning Carlsen, uh, uh, Søren Karl Jakobsen, uh, a lot of other Danish uh, guys from my generation have, have, have refined our language and, and still trying to challenge, uh, to, to find new ways of experimenting with storytelling. And, and uh, 
way of working with actors and so on. So I think that, uh, that we have a very dynamic and, and very uh, interactive uh, situation in and people are talking a lot in Denmark about art and, and film and dramaturgy and uh, how we can. But the big problem is, of course, to get the money for our film because our resources are very limited. So, and, and that's one of the reasons why it took me 20 years to get money straight together for this film. Anna Sreffen, tusen Tag. Thank you for joining us here in Lübeck yeah. online and hoping to see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah. Same to you, Herr. Bye-bye, Lübeck. <laughs>